I first met Bill Parcells um, during the 1982 campaign. Bill came in uh, as our new defensive coordinator, and he had an immediate impact on, I think, all of us. And uh, we knew that it was a new sheriff in town almost immediately the day he arrived. Shut up! Time out! It was unorthodox, his methodology. It was very, very forceful. What the f are you doing staying 10 yards in the backfield? Get up on the line! But he did it with a sense of humanity. Hey, Phil, I'll run the game! I know. I'm sending goal line in, well, bud. somebody give me something. Okay. I ain't got time to Signal. make a call. When Bill first came to us, he took a sabbatical almost immediately because he had some personal issues that he wanted to deal with. And I asked him, well, why would you want to come back to this madness of NFL coaching if indeed you had a secure position as an insurance salesman? He said, George, I sat in that office, I sat in that room day after day, and I came to one definitive conclusion. I am a football coach, period. And that's why I'm back here with the Giants. In 1986, just three seasons after being promoted to head coach, Parcells led the New York Giants to a 14-2 record and the franchise's first Super Bowl appearance. First and goal from the one-yard line. Power set. Joe Morris near side to the right. He's going in, standing up, and this one's history. Four years later in Tampa, for Super Bowl 25, Parcells produced another stroke of brilliance. Super Bowl 25, I think that, to be honest with you, I think Buffalo had the better team. But Bill Parcells had the uncanny ability to have these guys rise at the appropriate time. O.J. Touchdown! O.J. Anderson was the MVP of that game. Most people had given up on O.J., but not Bill Parcells. Bill kept motivating O.J. to tell him, you know, you still got a little bit of tread on the tires. He was absolutely right. And uh, as a result of that, he also produced a second uh, Super Bowl victory. Snap, spot. In the air, it's got the distance, it is no good! And the Giants are gonna win the Super Bowl. It's easy to assess Bill's, uh, his qualities, his attributes, because first of all, you have to start with his, uh, his football IQ, which I think is, is unprecedented. The second thing, he is an absolute master at identifying talent. And not only the talent that's on the football field, but those that he depends on as his assistant coaches. And he was a master at motivating. Come on, Romo. You should have known pre-snap what to do there. Bill Parcells looked at every individual differently, and he was able to understand what was it that really uh, was able to push him over the top to get him to see more and deliver more of himself. You go double see me, man. You don't hook it up. It's don't you thing. make your mind up with him. I'm, I'm trying not, to get the I first will. down. It's about competition here, son. You know what I'm saying? Bill was an in-your-face coach, and he was a perfectionist, which. You know, it's, it drives you crazy because if Bill sees something that he doesn't like, I mean, he's going to stop. He's going to make you perform it over and over again until you get it right. You're going to be tired of me. Oh, you're going to be tired of me. Come game day, uh, he expects that same sort of execution out on the football field. That execution was the hallmark of a Bill Parcells team as he remains the only head coach in NFL history to take four different teams to the playoffs. When you look at the swath of, uh, of success that Bill has had over so many franchises, you can only come to one conclusion that the man is a definitive winner, whether it's in New York, whether it's in Dallas, whether it's in New England. It didn't matter where Bill went. He's made teams relevant, and uh, he's done it unapologetically, and he's done it, uh, I think, very effectively. That's the way to go, fellas. Atta boy, there you go. I think that the true uh, memories of Bill Parcells is his results. Him being hoisted upon the shoulders of those guys who respected and admired him, him being underdogged in, in so many ways and, and emerging victoriously. I think he should be remembered as the winner that he is. I am honored to present my coach, Bill Parcells, for enshrinement into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, Presenting Bill Parcells for enshrinement into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, George Martin. I want to thank George for his kind words, and I want to mention why I picked him to present me. In the 83, 4, 5 seasons, in my formative years as a head coach, 
George was a co-captain along with the great Harry Carson. He was also my player representative. And in those days, the rules and regulations in the league weren't the same, and we had to figure a lot of things out on our own. And George had to kind of please three masters, the organization, the coaching staff, and his own teammates. He was unwavering in his support to all three factions. And quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, without that support, I don't think I'd be here tonight. He was, he was a great, great help to me. And I'm honored to have him present me. I want to thank the committee for their expressed confidence in me. I know there are a lot of deserving people out there. Some deserve it more than I do. But I want to tell the committee members that none of those could possibly appreciate it more than I do. I'm extremely grateful. The only thing I would ask them to do is when they put my bust in the hall tomorrow, I'd like to be somewhere near Lawrence Taylor so I keep an eye on that sucker. My classmates, we got a good group. I've seen them all play extensively, and I'm proud to be among them, and I'm proud to join with you in paying tribute to them. I'm going to talk first just a little about my professional life. I worked for four organizations as a coach and one as an administrator in the NFL. And um, this time of year, most organizations try to portray themselves in a manner that gives their fan base an indication that they're trying to compete for the division and the championships and all those kinds of things. But I found out over the years that the commitment has varying degrees in the NFL. Now, I worked for the New York Giants, a flagship franchise, the Mara family, Robert Kraft at the New England Patriots, the late Leon Hess, and the great Jerry Jones and his family there in Dallas. More recently as administrator, Steve Ross and Wayne Heisinger. And I've seen coaches go to these franchises and get fired very quickly because the situation would not allow them to succeed. Fortunately for Bill Parcells, I was never in one of those situations. Every organization that I worked for supported me to the fullest. And I'm grateful to the ownership of those places because that's what allows you and the players to succeed and go forward and become champions. And without that, you got no shot. But I was lucky to have it all the time. Now, my coaching staff, history has showed what I had, ladies and gentlemen. Top assistant coaches, sometimes sometime full-time assistant coaches their whole career, great position coaches, some retired, some still going, others on to college head coaching jobs, bowl championships, and then others in pro football, division championships, conference championships, and several Super Bowls. I was lucky to have some of the top names currently as head coaches in pro football. And and I want them to know that I'm grateful for their support of me. Very, very grateful. I know I couldn't do it. That, that's the nuts and bolts of a, a football operations, your assistant coaches. And I just want to say I take pride in their individual accomplishments. And I'm looking for a couple more championships out of some of them. So let's go. <laughs> Players, I got four or five of them up here on the stage with me. That ought to tell you all I need to know. But there was a time in my career when this whole thing could have gone either way. After the 83 season and into the 84 season, it was touch and go. Another loss or two in a row probably would have meant the end. I'm not positive, but that's the way I was thinking at the time, and I knew my players knew it. But coincidentally, there was kind of a confluence of circumstances that just occurred all at once. And the best way to put it is I had the exact right kind of players, understood my personality, bought into the program at the absolute most critical time 
in my career. And that's that 84 and 5 group that had to run that gauntlet, and I know how hard it was, and I love you guys for it, and I'm proud that you became champ champions because of it. Now, I had a lot of people when I first came in the league to help me. And I have to mention just a few names quickly. The late Al Davis, I don't know why he befriended me, but he advised me over a number of years. Tom Landry, Chuck Knox, Chuck Knowles, some of the great names in football history took the time when I solicited information from them. And I always made up my mind, if I was ever in that position, I would help any young coach that ever asked, and I've tried to follow through with that. On the personnel side, Buck O'Kilroy, the late Mike Holovac, Gil Brandt, and my longtime friend and confidant, Ron Wolf, helped me on the personnel side. And I'm grateful to them for that. You know, coaches like players now, they need agents. My first one was named Robert Fraley. I shared him with Cortez Kennedy. He was killed on a plane crash in the mid-90s. And when the induction results were announced, this year for this Hall of Fame class. Tez called me and he said, Coach, you know what? Robert had been proud of us. And you know what, Tez? We were lucky to have him, man. I'll tell you. <laughs> Since that time, Jimmy Sexton picked it up for me. He's been a great friend. His secretary, Amy, done all the things necessary to support me and my efforts and uh, did a great job. And I thank you, Jimmy. Appreciate it, man. Now, you know, a coach, has secretaries, unfortunately, for them. And you might not know this, but Mondays are literally blue Mondays in the NFL, no matter what happened on Sunday. Because on Monday, no matter whether you won or lost, something's bad. Some group on your team didn't play the way you wanted it to. Someone's hurt. Someone can't practice. Someone's out for the season, and you got your pro department scurrying around trying to look for his replacement in 48 hours. Someone has an issue, and you got to deal with it. And there are five things that happen every day. I've always told all my coaches that went out coaching that happen in pro football every day that you wish wouldn't happen. And if you don't have the mentality to deal with that, you need to get out of the business. But these secretaries, they're pretty sharp. They learn when they start hearing these short one-word answers that a coach should not be talked to on Monday because he's not worth talking to on Mondays. So I thank their, those girls. They're here tonight for their understanding and appreciate their support. On a more personal note, I didn't come up the hard way. I didn't come up the easy way. I grew up in an average American family, northern New Jersey. Had a great dad. Had a lot of wisdom imparted it to me. Had a mother that was highly confrontational. I probably got a little of that as well. Had two brothers, one of whom is deceased. I know he's looking down. My other brother's here tonight. And I had a sister. I know she's watching tonight. And uh, it was all good. I guess that's the phrase now everybody's using. It was all good, and that's the way it was. I have three lovely daughters, and I can remember in the pursuit of my jobs traveling around the country that every once in a while, probably usually about every two or three years, I used to have them, gather them around when they were schoolgirls, that kitchen table, and tell them that we were going to have to move again. And to look at the dismay and consternation and uncertainty on their faces was very painful to me. And I always was on alert when we got to our next destination to hear something that gave me an indication that the acclimation process was underway. Like they liked their school, I met a new friend, the teacher seemed okay. Now retrospectively, as I see them as grown women, raising families of their own, they know how proud I am of them, how much I love them. And I think the experience that they had in moving to different quadrants of the country, I know that they travel fearlessly now. Uh, they're not intimidated by change. And uh, they're directing their children in a proper manner. And 
they're productive citizens in society, and I felt like that was my main job as a parent. So I love you girls. My former wife, Judy, who kept the home fires burning, when I either couldn't be, and there was a lot of this next thing, or wasn't there, she kept them burning. And I have repeatedly told her over the years that I think there's a great integrity about that. And I know full well that if it was just left to me, that I wouldn't have got the job done. I was not only married to her, but I was married to something else as well. So I commend her for a job well done, and I thank her very much for it. Now I gotta tell you about a special guy. He's here tonight, he's 92 years old. My high school basketball coach. His name's Mickey Corcoran. He's pretty famous in North Jersey. He, uh, he was everything that a 14-year-old guy needed. He was a coach, a teacher, a disciplinarian, a butt kicker. And I don't know how to characterize this relationship that we've had for 58 years, but whatever adjective you could use to portray something good, you could use it with this relationship. He's been a great friend to me. He's been like a second father. He's somebody I could always talk to, a guidance counselor. He knows the love I have in my heart for him. As I said, he's 92, and I got to get 10 or 15 more right, years out of you, Buster, so let's go. <laughs> Another man, first guy to ever give me a head coaching job, Hastings College in the mid-60s, Dean Pryor. He's here tonight, thank God. And I want to tell you something. He taught me one vital, vital piece of information that I took with me and preached to every organization, to every university, to my coaching staff, to my individual coaches, and I remind myself every day. And that vital piece of information was, Bill, the players deserve a chance to win. And you, as an organization or a university, and a coaching staff, and an individual coach, and a head coach, have an obligatory responsibility to give it to them. And I thank Dean for that piece of advice, because I carried it with me and preached it all my life. So thank you. <laughs> One other guy I'd be remiss if I would, didn't mention. I know he's down in Mississippi tonight. He's still coaching. He's a sick puppy like I was. Name's Ray Perkins. And he's the one that got me involved in pro football along with the late Ron Earhart. And I just wanted to mention Ray and tell him how much I appreciated him taking a chance on me when he didn't really know what he was getting. So I say, thanks, Ray. I know you're watching. Now, I want to just say something about my experience in pro football. And there's a guy up on this stage that kind of got me thinking about something. And his name's Steve Young, and I heard him say this. I don't mean to put you on the spot, Steve. I heard him say this several years ago. He said that the locker room is a great laboratory for human behavior. And when he said that, it just kind of hit me. And I said, you know what? This guy's right. This guy is absolutely right. Now, talent aside, we know it's the football business, but the only prerequisite for acceptance into that locker room is you gotta be willing to contribute to the greater good. And if you are willing to do that, you are readily accepted. And if you're not, you're pretty much quickly rejected. Now we got all kinds in this place, okay? We got white, we got black, we got Latin, we got Asian, we got Samoans, we got Tongans, we got Native Americans. Ladies and gentlemen, I played and coached with them all and the only thing that made any difference is, are you willing to help? And if you are, come on in. And if you're not, get the heck out of here. Yeah. Now, there are a lot, you'll remember this one, Steve. There are a lot of exit doors in pro football. And by exit doors, I mean 
vehicles that organizations or players or coaches could use to intimate to the public that it wasn't their fault that the team performed poorly. But Monday, about 5 o'clock in the afternoon after we watched those films, very seldom are any of those editors taken because it's a premium in guys like this. It's at a premium. So we got the greater good and we got accountability. Now, we've got some rules and regulations in the locker room, but they're not written down. But after you've been there just a couple of days, you know what they are. And if should some, someone should deviate and violate those rules, you find out that there's a judge and jury in that room, and they act decisively. And their decisions are final, because we don't have any appellate courts in there, OK? So we got, we've got the greater good, we've got accountability, and now we've got law and order. Now we've got a wide range of emotions in this place, ladies and gentlemen. We've got happiness, we've got humor, practical jokes, hilarity, success, achievement, and then we've got that momentary time of exhilaration where you hoist that championship trophy over your head and I don't know what happens, but some mystical blood kinship is formed. And although it's a fleeting moment, that kinship lasts for the rest of your life. And the thing I'm most proud of with my teams is they have it. And I know because I lived it because when something goes wrong with one of them, all the others run to help. And I know because they've run to help me. Now. On the other side of that locker room, there's darkness, there's defeat, there's despondency, there's pain. You see those players carrying those IVs onto the aircraft after a midsummer or early season game in a hot weather city, and they're carrying their own IVs onto the plane, and the trainers are rushing to pack them in ice, and they can't sit in their seats because they'll cramp up, so they got to lay in the idle. Ladies and gentlemen, they don't put that on television, but I was there to see it. There's pain, there's injury, there's tragedy, and even death. And I wish all of American society could have experienced what I experienced in this place. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it is a priceless, priceless education. In closing, about 10 minutes after I was named head coach of the Giants and my first press conference was over, the patriarch owner of the New York Giants, the late Wellington Mara, was at my office door and he said, Bill, let's take a walk. And he took me down the stairs, of course, to that same place that I was just talking about. And in the old Giant Stadium, the Giant players will remember that as you walk through the players' entrance, there was a little room to the left, and it was like a little alcove room and had a couple chairs in it. And Wellington took me over to the wall in that place. And on the wall was a little plaque and it had an inscription on it. And coincidentally, that inscription was attributed to the first black player ever inducted into this Hall of Fame. His name was Emlyn Tunnell, and was inducted in the class of 1967. And that inscription said, losers assemble in little groups and complain about the coaches and the players in other little groups. But winners assemble as a team. Well, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I get to do just that. I'm honored, I'm grateful, and I'm thankful to every single one of you out there that had something to do with this. Thank you very much.